Take your Bibles with me, if you would, and turn to the book of Galatians once again. Galatians chapter 1. We talked several weeks ago as we began this series called No Other uh, Gospel, that uh, if you were to take, um, well, there's a tendency, rather, in our, our uh, society and in our culture today to kind of lump Christianity in with all of the other world religions, to speak of it as if... Uh, all religions essentially teach the same thing. You'll hear that uh, very common today. You'll hear it. I heard it on the news this past week. I was uh, watching a, uh, a commentator, and, and, and he actually made that statement, just simply said, well, all religions teach essentially the same thing. In reality, however, if you were to do a survey of the world religions, um, such as in Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, you'd find that uh, there are vast and, and extremely important differences in all of the world religions. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Brother Brinker on Sunday nights brought a series of messages and uh, kind of explored uh, the major world religions and what they teach and those kind of things. And, uh, and, and we saw that there are very large differences in how we understand the nature of God, the nature of salvation, uh, all in the nature of man, in fact. Um, but if you were to take all of the world religions in the world, uh, apart from Christianity, and boil them down, they all teach one thing in common. And that is that in order to be made right with God, you must do something. Uh, in fact, we've summarized it here a couple weeks ago. If you boil them down, uh, they could be summarized by the word do, whereas Christianity could be summarized with the word done. Christianity is fundamentally different uh, than any other world religion because it teaches that what Jesus has done for us on the cross is what we could never have done for ourselves. He paid the full debt of our sin through his death on the cross. He was buried and three days later rose again so that we can have new life. Furthermore, it teaches us that this salvation is available to anyone who will believe. We generally refer to that doctrine as the doctrine of justification by faith. And really, it's impossible to overstate its importance in the life of the believer and to the life of the church. It is really the fundamental doctrine of Christianity. It is a key doctrine that we hold. Um, We've been looking at the book of Galatians for the last couple of weeks and talking about the fact that there is no other gospel. And you remember that when Paul planted the churches in Galatia and got them up and running. Now, Galatia is a region. We might think of it sort of as the American equivalent of a state, although they would have called it a province back then. It, it was an area of the Roman Empire, and, and Paul preached in several towns of this region, uh, uh, places like Lystra and Derby, Iconium and uh, Pisidia and Antioch. These are all the various cities that Paul went to, preached the gospel, established churches there, and then he went on, as Paul did. Uh, Paul never spent a great deal of time anywhere. The longest that Paul stays any one place is three and a half years. Um, normally he's there a matter of months and then he moves on. He moves on to go and continue on this first missionary journey and he receives a report back that there has been a group of false teachers that have come in and have begun to subtly change the gospel. They have told the Galatians that in order to truly be saved, they must add something to their faith in Christ. What the false teachers basically say is uh, that, that it's important to put your trust in Christ, but there's something else that you must do. And in Galatia, it was that they were saying they needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow through with the Jewish law of circumcision. And Paul reacts extremely strongly. I, I, I don't even know if that's a good phrase. He re, in the strongest possible of terms, Paul writes back to those churches and said, says, you are in danger of abandoning the very faith that has saved you. You are about to abandon the gospel if you accept this teaching. Next week, or two weeks from now, we're going to look a little more deeply at the actual doctrine of justification, but what I want to do this morning is walk you through a little Bible 
biographical section. Now, Paul uses his own personal history in this book to illustrate a couple of very key points, all right? So first of all, I want you to notice that the, the, the first thing that the, the false teacher seemed to have been saying about Paul was that Paul was preaching something false, that Paul had, had heard this, his message, either he made it up himself or, or perhaps they might have even been saying he had received it from someone else. So the very first thing that Paul wants to do is defend where he got the gospel from. And what he shows us is that justification by faith, this doctrine of just being justified by faith, has been revealed to him by God. Notice what happens in uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism far beyond many of my, uh, uh, far beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers that when he who has set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go to, up, to, up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul wants to make a couple of points very clear here. First of all, the gospel that he preached, he did not receive it from man, nor was he taught it. Paul is saying, listen, this isn't just a tradition that I pass down. This isn't just something I've heard somebody else say, and I'm just parroting it. Paul wants them to know that he's gotten this directly from God. This is important because it goes back to the source He's not just repeating what he's heard other people say, but rather what he has heard God say. You know, there's an important point there. The gospel in your life must be more than something you've just heard from someone else. It, it, it has to have a personal level. It's not just about, listen to me, it, it is very important for us as parents to preach and teach the gospel to our children. But at some point, that gospel must become personal to them. They must come to the point where they understand that this is not just learning a lesson from my parents or from my Sunday school teacher or from my pastor, but rather they hear it as the word of the living God. I'm going to tell you what a big problem that goes on in churches in America today and it just as much infects Baptist as it does any other denomination, all right? I can't pick on other denominations, but I can pick on Baptist because I are one, all right? And, uh, and uh, so I'm going to just kind of say this very frankly. We have the same problem that we point out in all the other denominations, we're very good at being able to say, well, that group and that group, they kind of teach a, a rote memorization. They kind of teach this little formula. And as long as the kids can repeat back that formula, they claim, well, you're all right with God. We do the same thing sometimes. The reality is, is that as the gospel, as they read and understand and listen, as the spirit of the living God opens up the heart of that unconverted person, the gospel becomes personal to them. It's not just Jesus died for us. It is that Jesus died for me. And Paul is re recognizing the fact here that, that he isn't just going on some tradition, but rather what he has heard directly from God. And, of course, you know uh, later on in this same verse, the second thing that he talks about, he says he received it by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, now he was on the road to Damascus to go and persecute the church. Remember, Paul uh, shows no inkling or no interest at all in the things of God, or in, the, in the gospel rather, um, as he is traveling to Damascus. He's going there for the purpose of persecuting Christians. 
And yet, while he was on his way, you'll remember what happened. Uh, he was blinded, and he recognized that Jesus had appeared to him. You remember what he says? He says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And Paul is miraculously converted as he recognized who Jesus was and who, what Jesus had come to do. Later on in this passage, uh, Paul uh, uses some phrases there uh, that he uses to discuss what happened to him and, and how he understands his salvation. First of all, um, notice what he says uh, there in... Um, and um, verse number 15, he says, But when he, that he there is Jesus or God, when he who had set me apart before I was born. Paul says, if I look back at my salvation, I understand that my salvation did not find its roots on the road to Damascus. It finds its roots in the eternity past. Did you know that, brothers and sisters? Your, your salvation experience didn't start the day you got saved. But actually, it started in the mind of God before he ever even created the world. I don't know about you, but that, that, that's encouraging to me. I don't know that I completely understand that. People say, do you understand the doctrine of election? No. Anybody who tells you they do is arrogant. The reality is that when we're looking at this particular doctrine, we are looking at a doctrine so grand and so vast that no human being could ever possibly comprehend it. Why? Because we're looking at the mind of God. Let me give you, a, let me give you an understanding about that just for a moment. Think about what God's like for a moment. You and I experience everything in time, right? Everything. Now, really, you can remember the past but it's gone, you hope there's a future, amen? All of you are hoping that there's something past this sermon, right? You're hoping he's going to let us go, we're going to go eat, there's something out there, but we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what that, we live really as human beings stuck in a single moment, and we recognize this. Time just kind of, you know, Steve Miller said, just keeps on ticking, 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 right? And uh, it just kind of keeps moving along. God, on the other hand, does not experience time the way you and I do. God is eternity. Now, let me blow your mind for a minute. That means that God lives in every moment of time simultaneously. There is no past. There is no present. There is no future. It is just all one single moment. So when the Bible talks about what God does in eternity past, don't get all frustrated and freaked out about that. Just understand God knows what you're going to do 20 minutes from now. God knows what you're going to do three hours from now and three years from now. And you know what, Natalie? He knows who you're going to marry. It's not that doofus either. All right? All right? I'm just teasing. All right? And uh, God knows uh, everything that's going to happen in your life. He knows, and he is, and, and he's, a, so Paul looks back and he says, I recognize that before I was ever born, God set me apart for salvation. He, he repeats that uh, later on in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now, some people get freaked out by the fact that they say, well, if that's what happened, then, then then what's the point of preaching the gospel if God's chosen anyways? What, what's the point of, of, of responding? Well, listen, not only does God ordain the ends, but he ordains the means. And the means of our salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the way that is applied to our life is through repentance and faith. And there is a responsibility to There is a responsibility to every believer to preach the gospel to the whole world. Amen. There's a responsibility, for, and there's a responsibility when you hear the gospel for you to respond. You say, preacher, how do you make those two things work out? I don't. God does. Amen? It's too big for me to understand and to comprehend. I just know that's what the Bible teaches, and I just accept it. 
And if you've got a problem with that, well, take it up with the Lord. All right? Uh, number two, he says not only was he set apart before he was born, but then he goes to the really, to the moment of his salvation. He says, and I was called by his grace. Do you notice what he says? But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. That word grace means unmerited favor. God doesn't choose you. He doesn't save you. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, change your life as a result of works. He doesn't, result, he doesn't save you as a result of how good of a person you are or how well you can keep the law, but rather we are saved by his unmerited favor. The call of God to salvation is not based on anything we do. It is not by works. You know that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of, your, not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. That word call there refers to the whole complex of events that happens at the moment of our salvation. It refers to our hearing of the gospel. Now, I don't just mean the physical hearing of the gospel. Back when I was a, a young man and before I became a Christian, I heard the gospel many times physically. You know what I mean by that? I mean, I sat in the church. The preacher preached the gospel. He told me about Jesus dying. He told me that he died for my sin. He told me that he was buried. He told me that he rose again. And, and my Sunday school teacher told me those things. My parents told me those things. I could read them in my Bible and, and, and see those same things. But one day, one day, Something happened that was amazing. God called me to salvation. I heard the gospel in my heart for the very first time. It was different. I remember that day like it was yesterday. The preacher, uh, actually it was a guest preacher in our church. He had, been the, he had been the church planter that had come and planted our church. We, I went to a church that hadn't been around for all that long. You know, you go back to this church, it's, uh, it, it's uh, uh, we're really closer to 200 years old. It's, a, it's an old church. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, the church that I went to growing up had only been there for about 15 years when we started going there. And uh, the planter that had come and preached the gospel up there and had planted that church came back to preach a revival service. And he got up one night and he began to preach on the passage of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I loved it because as as the preacher was preaching, when he get to that point about whosoever, he reminded us and he taught us that whosoever means you. And I'm going to tell you something, Brother Clyde. It was as if God was speaking to me personally that night. It was different than any other sermon I'd ever heard before. It wasn't distance. It wasn't academic. It wasn't God speaking in general. It was God speaking to me. Now, I didn't go forward that night, but I remember going home under great conviction of sin, recognizing that I was lost, and if I were to die, I'd spend eternity in hell, and I was scared to death. No, mark this down. We, we, we don't... Uh, we don't intentionally try to scare people into heaven, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. When you understand the wrath of God... And you understand the fact that you're a sinner, it will scare you a little bit. Amen? A good, healthy fear right there. And I was like, oh, I've got to do something. I've got to respond to this. And I recognized there was a simple response. I turned from my sin. I trusted Jesus that night. I heard God. I responded to him by placing my, turning from my sin and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I was saved. That's what Paul has in mind there when he talks about called by his, that whole immediate road to Damascus experience. Then he says, uh, he says, who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. On the road to Damascus, God revealed his son, Jesus Christ. 
to Paul. The word there uh, revealed is the word apocalypto. And it has to un- of unmasking or unveiling something, pulling the veil away so that we can see it and so that it can be revealed. Paul, up to that point, had heard lots of things about Jesus. He probably knew a great deal about the life and the ministry of Jesus from, from the people that he was arresting, but on the road to Damascus, God revealed his son to him. He pulled away the mask. Paul saw him for who he was, and he responded in repentance and faith. That's what happens at the moment of our salvation. Now, we may not have an experience like Paul, but I'm going to understand. I'm going to say this to you. On that night that I was saved, not only did God show me what my heart was like, but he showed me the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Amen? He reveals to us who Jesus is. Okay, so Paul says, I want you to understand, I didn't get that from someone else. I I saw that and I heard, that was by revelation. God showed me so that they can't go back and say, well, you were just preaching something that you heard. There's a second thing that Paul wants to remind them in, is that justification by faith has been apostolically approved. Now, that's an important concept. I want you to stop here and say this. Paul says in that first section, look, I didn't go and depend on the apostles to give me the gospel, but after they heard what I preached, they were in agreement with it. Amen? We should never ignore the church when it comes to our doctrine and our faith. We ought to confirm what we've heard and what we've understood about the Scriptures with other believers to see if they're seeing and understanding the same thing. So that's what Paul says. He talks here about two different visits that he made with the apostles. Verse 18, he says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for 15 days. Now Cephas there is Peter. He says, uh, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, uh, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. In verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. Paul said, listen, when I got saved, I didn't go up immediately to Jerusalem. I didn't run up there to hear what they were preaching. I just went right out and began to preach and began to do things. After three years, I went up, but the only apostles that I saw were Peter and James. Now, can I I say this? You know why only two of them would come out and see him? The rest were scared to death. This is the guy that had been persecuting the church. This is the guy that had killed Stephen. This is the guy that was on the road to Damascus to go and try to destroy Christians. This guy was an opponent of the gospel. He had been a persecutor of the church. And they're hearing, yeah, he got saved, but you know, they're a little bit weary. They're a little bit wary of of him. Why why are we going to let him come back over and speak to us? They're afraid that he might really be persecuted. But here's what happens. He goes and he talks to Peter and he talks to James and then as a result of his preaching ministry, see what's Paul doing for those period, this period of time? From the very moment Paul got saved, he started preaching. Amen? He didn't wait. He didn't, he didn't delay. He just started preaching. And they've heard what he's preaching, and notice what he says in verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. They hadn't met me for the most part in person, but they knew what I was preaching. They knew what I was doing, and they glorified God because of it. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about the second visit. He said, then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. 
But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they may bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they see, uh, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no impartiality. Those who say, uh, I, those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel of the, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted to the, to, with the gospel of the circumcised, circumcised, for he who works through Peter for his apostolic ministry to, to the circumcised worked also through me uh, to mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very eager thing I was, uh, the very thing I was eager to do. I want you to notice what Paul says here. Paul says, I've, I went up and, and I spoke on two different occasions, one after I'd been preaching for three years, one after I'd been preaching for 14 years, and I met with the apostles and they agreed with me that what I was preaching was the gospel. In fact, he mentions taking Titus. Now, you know why he mentions taking Titus? He notices there that Titus was a Greek. Titus was uncircumcised. Titus was a Gentile believer. He had not been circumcised. And what Paul is doing is saying, look, here's the gospel that I've been preaching out there. Here's one of my real live converts. Here's a Gentile convert puts Titus up there, Titus gives his testimony, and the apostles and the church in Jerusalem agree that Paul is preaching the truth of the gospel. Amen? Furthermore, they conclude that the false brethren who had snuck in, and man, I'm just going to tell you a little secret. There is a whole section of Scripture that could be written about what it means to come in and spy out their freedom in Christ that we're not going to get into this morning. But, but they've come in to try to find out what's going on, and the apostles in Jerusalem even stood against them. What Paul is saying is, is that this truth that I've been, pre that I've been preaching was approved by the very pillars of the early church. And you remember that, that's something that's very important. The apostles that he's talking about are the men who had walked and witnessed the life of Jesus. They're the authority. Remember, the New Testament, for the most part, has not been written in this period that Paul's talking about. They can't go back and say, well, let's go and back and look at, at the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. So he goes and he appeals to the apostles and says, listen, guys, this is what I'm preaching. Am I in line with what you're saying? And they said, absolutely. Absolutely, Paul. And they give him the right hand of fellowship, which is a New Testament way of saying they were in complete agreement. Paul's saying this gospel that I preach, not only did I receive it by from no one else. I've received it directly from God, but also I went and, and I tested it out with the apostles to make sure I was preaching what the word, you know, there'll be times when there'll be uh, apparent conflicts over, you know, when did the doctrine of justification come out? Paul wants us to understand it. This was the, this was the gospel that was preached from the earliest days of the church. This is the truth of the gospel. And he wants them to be clear that, that this has been the message of the church. It was not something invented by Paul. It's not something that later got invented by Protestants or by Baptists or by any other group. This was the very doctrine taught by Jesus, taught by the apostles, and approved of by the early church. He wants them to be clear. There's a third thing he reminds us. Not only has the gospel, justification by faith been revealed to us by God and approved by the apostles, but it also has been under constant threat. Notice what he says in the nurse verses, verse 11. He said, but when Cephas came to Antioch, now you remember something here. Just let me give you a brief history. 
the church in Antioch is an absolutely fascinating church. Uh, it was founded right after the first organized persecution of the church broke out. You remember that after they had stoned Stephen, they began to go out. In fact, Paul himself was one of the leaders of that early persecution, and they had broken out. And the Bible tells us over in the book of Acts that some of the, some of the early Gentile disciples had arrived in the city of Antioch, and they planted a church. This church becomes the mother church for all of the Gentile churches. This is going to become the church that Paul and Barnabas settled down in and from which they are sent out on all three of their missionary journeys. If you were to trace the history of First Baptist Church back, we're doing that right now for a little study uh, that we're putting together and looking back through the history of the church. And, and I've been reading a lot of the old uh, documents and I've read all the way back to uh, 1962 already. And uh, we can go a lot further than that, you know. And, and uh, in fact, uh, and it's really interesting. But you went back and you traced our church back, you know, and, and you go back some way back in 1790s, you would find there was a group of people who planted this church. But, but they came from somewhere else. And they were sent by another church, and then they're back. And if you were to trace our roots all the way back to the first century, you'd find the roots go all the way back to Antioch. Those churches go all the way back. They're the mother church of all Gentile churches. It is the only church in the New Testament where nothing bad is recorded. Very interesting. Every other church in the New Testament has some blight, has some problem, some conflict, some difficulty. Antioch, never anything negative mentioned about Antioch. It is a strong, it is in fact the strongest of all of the New Testament churches. It is the mother of all the missionary churches and, and it is unique. And this is the church that Paul um, has settled down. You remember after the gospel had been preached there, the apostles say, wait a minute, Gentiles are getting saved. Um, Peter, go down there and check that out. They send Peter down, or send Barnabas down, rather. Barnabas gets down there and goes, yes, the gospel's come to the Gentiles. And he says, let me go find Paul. And he brings Paul back, and together, for a period, they pastor that church, strengthen that church, and then from that church go out on missionary journeys. So look what happens. Peter has come down. But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. That's interesting. Peter here comes down to Antioch, and Paul says, there was a time when I had to confront Peter. Notice what he had to confront him over. He says, for before certain men uh, came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Paul says, look, here's what happens. Church in Antioch, mostly, Jew, mostly Gentiles. Peter comes down to check things out. And at first, Peter is eating with the Gentiles, no problem. See, table fellowship was a big deal back then. Who you sat down and ate with, Jews and Gentiles, typically in culture, never sat down and ate together. That was a strict no-no for both groups, quite frankly. The Jews wouldn't sit down with the Gentiles, and the Gentiles didn't want to sit down with the Jews. And so table fellowship was a really big deal back then, all right? And so uh, he comes down, and at first, there's no problem. He's sitting there and eating with the Gentiles. They're having a great time. Everything's going good. But then... James has sent some more folks down from the church of Jerusalem. Now, these are mostly Jews. Now, when the Jews arrived, Peter gets a little self-conscious, and he refuses to sit and eat with the Gentiles. In fact, Paul says this became so epidemic that even Barnabas pulled back. Now, for most of the people sitting there, that probably didn't seem like too big of a deal. Jews and Gentiles didn't eat together. This probably seemed fine. Paul recognizes, however, this is an affront to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Notice what he says. He says, verse 14, but when I saw that their conflict was, their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, Paul says, when I looked at what they were doing, I recognized what they're doing and the way that they're behaving is in direct contradiction to the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus, through the gospel, has broken down all those barriers. Amen? Those barriers don't exist after the gospel comes into effect in your life. And so Paul says, when I saw that what they were doing wasn't in line with the, with the gospel, notice what he says. Um, he says, uh, uh, I said to Cephas before them all, you got to love Paul's tact here. Paul didn't go and say, uh, Peter, could we go off to the side here and can I talk to you for a minute? Peter says, Paul said, I just stood up in front of everybody. And I confronted Peter right there. And notice what he says. He says, uh, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul says, I confronted him. When I saw hypocrisy, you know what Paul's saying there? Paul says, I have an unbroken chain of standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ, even against someone as prominent as Peter. I mean, think about that for a moment. Peter's kind of the leader of the apostles back in Jerusalem. He's the guy that preached at the day of Pentecost. Uh, some people, uh, some groups wrongly think that he was the first pope, which is a problem if Paul confronted him. Paul says, listen, I confronted you, and I confronted Peter, rather, and when he wasn't living in line with the gospel, I uh, approached him and I rebuked him, and the implication is that Peter must have gotten right. Peter must have recognized his error and his mistake. What Paul is saying here is this. The gospel is always under attack. What Paul saw there was that in doing this very simple thing of refusing to eat with Gentiles, they were actually compromising on a fundamental truth of the gospel. They're saying, listen, there's this division here that the gospel says is broken down in Christ. They're making the law into something that it shouldn't have been in their lives. And Paul says, I confronted them about it. You know, the gospel's always under subtle attack. Whenever we add to the gospel or take away from the gospel, it's under attack. Paul says, I stood up for it. I heard it from God. When I preached it, the apostles agreed that was the gospel. And I've stood faithfully for it for all of this time. And he's reminding those Galatians that there's going to be a battle in their churches. They're going to have to stand up for the gospel. And there's a, he's going to lay it out exactly how justification works. We're going to look at this more in depth but later on. But look in verse 15. Paul goes on in the very next section. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Somebody says to you, where do you get the doctrine of justification? By faith alone, right there. Paul says, it's not by works of law, but it's by simple faith in Christ. Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. Listen to me. We can turn just about anything into a work. Amen. Well I'm saved because I'm a member at First Baptist Church. Membership here won't save you. Well, don't get me wrong, membership's an important thing. And if you come here and you attend here, you ought to become a member here. And you ought to participate fully in the life of the church. It's an important element of being a Christian, but it is not what makes you a Christian, amen? Well, you know, I must be okay. I must be saved because I got baptized. Baptism is a symbol of your salvation. You're no more saved because you were baptized, then you're married because you wear a wedding ring. 
The wedding ring is the symbol of your salvation, but it is not. Or the, or the wedding ring is the Well, for some of us, maybe it is the symbol of our salvation. That was a misstep. And it's not the symbol of our marriage and our commitment. It's a symbol, but not the reality. It's the covenant that we establish that makes us married. Amen? I lost my wedding ring. I lost it at a funeral probably 20 years. How do you lose a wedding ring at a funeral? I have no idea. Okay? That's why I lost it. Because I don't know where it is. I, I, I went to a funeral and I came back without a wedding ring. You explain that to your wife. All right? And, uh, and, uh, but, but, but that doesn't make me not married. It's a beautiful symbol. But it's not what makes us who we are. What, what brings us into a right relationship with God is that Jesus died for our sin. He was buried, and he rose again. And as a result of that message, we turn away from our sin, and we simply trust. That's what it means to believe. We simply put our trust, and that when Jesus said he accomplished on the cross, he is done. Amen? It is finished. And we simply trust him. Paul says, anytime you add to that or take away from that, you've lost the essence of the gospel. Amen? So he wants us to know that not only did he stand firm, but you and I need to stand firm. In our day and age, we need to stand firm for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. I pray now, Father, that you would take this message and when you use it, Speak to our hearts. I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that, Father, this might be their Damascus Road day. Not that you're going to appear in a vision like you did to Paul, but, Lord, just in the very depths and the reaches of their hearts. Father, today that you convince them of the truth of the gospel, that you'd reveal your son Jesus to them, to show them that he died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again. Lord, I pray today that they might come, Lord, and just simply bow before you and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve eternity in hell. But I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross. And Lord, I pray today that they might come to salvation. Father, for those that do know you but haven't become a member of the church, maybe it's they haven't professed their faith to you through publicly through baptism, Lord, or perhaps they haven't come and joined and, and become a part of a church. Lord, we pray today that your will would be done, that, Father, you'd speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.